Thank you very much. A real pleasure to be uh, in this panel now as a participant, in, in reality, and uh, opening this, uh, this panel. Let me say at the outset that this morning was very enlightening, and it became very clear, uh, several of the participants, uh, my friend Carlo Dada made it very clear, that yes, here we're looking at journalism uh, under fire, journalism in crisis because of safety issues, uh, because of political issues, because of an economic model, but in reality, there's more profound philosophical questions to deal with. What we're really dealing with today are questions of understanding communication as a whole and how much has communication changed with the new technologies and ICTs, and how much does journalism as a traditional profession change within the new, new technologies? And what are the new forms of journalism, citizen journalism, arising in these precise moments. And let me say at the beginning, a couple of global reflections that will serve the purpose of journalism is that when internet began growing, not right at the beginning, which was the exercise of academics, but it began growing with use, and when social networks were developed, we all understood that there was a huge leap in communication that the difference of internet was the past means of communication, were that all forms of communication, whether written or audiovisual, had a central communicating person or center that sent out a message that would be received by one or several people in a unidimensional way. What internet brought was the idea of the interactive form of communication because now you can send the message, yes, but more than a million people can receive the message simultaneously, can respond in real time, or can interconnect between themselves and share that message, or they can themselves resend the message to a new network and a new set of individuals. And it was this massiveness that multiplied geometrically the communication that made internet so powerful. So of course the immediate conclusion and the, the, the high expectations that many of us had is this is the perfect instrument for democratizing the world. It's a great instrument for freedom of expression because it will be free. Anyone can use it as long as we guarantee connectivity, of course. Uh, everyone will be able to say what they think and this will enhance knowledge societies or the reception of, of knowledge and the possibilities of more informed citizen participation and therefore it will make democracy stronger and will make all societies stronger and state structure stronger because there will be more transparency. In the time, we have come to recognize that this phenomenon did not exactly happen that way. We still have a big digital gap uh, based on economic differences in, in not only between nations but also within our own societies uh, we still have not gained the full respect of human rights by everyone and the full accessibility by everyone to the knowledge. We're now challenged by the new SDGs agenda approved last year in the General Assembly where SDG 16 clearly established as a precondition of reaching development that all states should guarantee public access to information. Why was it established under one of the goals? Because we still have not reached that level. And we can still say that there are gender gaps that we have not been able to breach. We don't have equal rights of women developed by internet. On the contrary, we have had a growth of sexual harassment of women and trafficking of young girls. We have had a harassment of minorities or we had had an increase of hate speech based on ethnicity, race, migration, or religion. So we must look upon ourselves as societies in a very critical way. Here we have a new wonderful instrument, and I'm not rejecting, by the way, the new technologies. I think they're wonderful, but we have to really analyze how societies are using it and what have we done to prepare the next generations to use it for peace building. In the UNESCO Constitution, it was mentioned by Director General and by the Chairman 
of the Executive Board this morning. The UNESCO Constitution mentions that it was established to build peace in the world by facilitating a free flow of ideas and knowledge among peoples of the world. This means that a free flow of ideas and knowledge is part of building peace. So therefore, we should be using these technologies for that. And journalism should be one of the fundamental issues that we should be protecting a free press with diversity and plurality to give everyone an opportunity to give a, an opinion, to analyze, to do investigative journalism, to comment or even to criticize mistaken policies. This is what it is all about. Tragically, one of the issues that has happened in society is that the idea of free news and social networks began first of all generating a lack of interest in traditional media and people went directly to the news. I have this discussion with my own children. It was very interesting to read a newspaper. I was challenging my son about a Sunday edition. Why don't we get a Sunday edition and look at the newspaper, even at the art section? Or the, And he said, why should I? This is, why should I kill a tree? He said, I go directly to what I'm interested in, and he'll find it in the computer. Yes, but he will miss out on a lot of other topics in, in the world. But on top of that, he is part of a highly educated sector of society. But on top of that, social networks, which are part of freedom of expression, but became the exchange of daily issues, of gossip, of rumors, of imagination sometimes of individuals. And that began circulating with equal speed the real facts or the news. So all of a sudden we were inundated by a world where gossip became interesting, where the stories that were being mentioned this morning get more clicks because the story about how uh, they breed cats in some part of the world becomes interesting for some individuals and probably more interesting than looking at all the news about wars and migration and refugees. So we have to look at this and understand that we did not balance the growth of media with media literacy programs and the understanding of media. But I think journalism, and, 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 and having been myself a radio journalist, journalism was not prepared also. We, did, we missed a bit the point. Also missed the understanding of certain sectors of population that we believe are wrong, but, but still are an important sector of population. And part of the tragedy came <clears throat> when we fall into this reality of today. The reality of today is that there is a regrowth of racism, xenophobia, right-wing populism that tries to establish limits and boundaries, separate individuals by their origin, whether economic, social, racial, or religious, tries to make a difference between peoples of the world instead of bringing them together, and tries to minimize the role of some for the benefit of others. And this is very tragic because then it began questioning our basic principles that we felt we had grown. But on top of that, we be they began noticing that rumors would pick up very easily. People would build an opinion based on uh, false information and based on simple uh, speculations. And therefore, politicians, especially this populist uh, type of politicians, began using this phenomenon. Populism, by the way, is not an ideology. Everyone knows that. Populism is a form of communication. It's a form of communication that distorts reality because speaks to the people of what they want to hear without necessarily proving what is being proposed. But it moves by moving feelings and not oftentimes the best of feelings, sometimes mistaken feelings of nationalism, for instance, or what becomes a national pride taken exacerbated and taken into a position of hatred of others. So populism becomes a very dangerous instrument because it grows. And they began understanding these political leaders that by using this information, they could easily change the result of plebiscites or elections. And this is what has been happening in the world. Now, of course, then came the term fake news, and I think it was very important to mention that here. For me, fake news is a very bad term, because that's also part of the trap. The trap was to call this disinformation campaign and these false pieces of information to call them news, because it is not news. They pretended to be news, yes, but it's not news. So just the term fake news generates a sense of mistrust of the press, which is what they're trying to gain. 
And on top of that, you have political leaders of the highest level challenging the press as those that are confusing the world when in reality, the intent is to disinform the world. And in a moment of disorder, of confusion, of information that cannot be verified, very many people, especially these populist leaders of the right, can benefit very easily. And this is where that, so what became a normal term fake news because of the practices they were doing, they have now turned around and they're the ones using it against the press and journalism. This is why we're having this reflection today because we are a crucial moment where we have to defend journalism. Of course, there will always be good and bad journalism. Not all journalists are the same. Not all facts are the same. Truth is not something we possess and we can grab. I always say truth is a process. Truth is something we build. But there is journalism of honesty where we are building the truth by honest journalists giving their opinion and giving their investigation and their time. And many of them taking serious risks to the extent of sacrificing their lives today around the world. This is important. And this is what we have to insist, that doing journalism is a service to the public, a very essential service to the public, which is not only a human right because of the right to access information, is not only fundamental to democracy, but today with the SDGs is fundamental for development. And finally comes the solution. Now we're receiving offers by everyone. Now we can have an algorithm that will tell us the truth. <laughs> but but like, like David Kay correctly and our colleagues Dunia and uh, Pansy Tlacula and, and Edison Lanza, the rapporteur, said very clearly, oftentimes in the solution we can have a new problem. Because I don't think that we need an algorithm to tell us what the truth is. And if we do, we're losing the notion of truth ourselves. We must be able to find it and to develop the truth, which is why, again, I insist the truth is not the result of an algorithm. The truth is something we build together in an honest dialogue. So we reject the idea of fake news as well as we reject the idea of algorithm for truth. Do we have to go back to fundamental basic principles of defending journalism, professional journalism. Professional journalism, that doesn't mean that you have to have a degree. I do believe there's journalists, there's community radios that may have community journalists at a local level. People that never studied journalism. There are citizen journalists and they're doing it well. We have professional journalists and big media. But what game brings them together is the honest intention of informing the public. And informing with diversity and plurality, trying to be objective, trying to give them different perspectives trying to give them the possibility of contrasting. Because ultimately, the most important element we must never forget is that what we're trying to build is critical minds, which is why May 3rd today, for us, the celebration of the World Press Freedom Day is building critical minds in a critical time. We have to, we think this is part of the mission we have forgotten. We have to build critical minds to understand the news, to understand the media, to understand how to use positively these new technologies and not to allow false leaders to use false information or disinformation to alter the course of the political history of their countries. Thank you. Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting in 1991.